Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. My name is Christopher Brown, as always, and today is Friday, our last episode in the School Board Trustees Week of Candidates that we've put together. And today we have Calgary Board of Education School Board Trustee Candidate for Ward 12 and 14, Charlene May. Charlene, thank you so much for doing this. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. It's kind of been a bucket list to be on a podcast. I never thought in a million years I'd be on one. I got into them at the start of the pandemic to kind of help me get to sleep at night and listen to true crime. And it's just really exciting to be on interviewed and ask questions and and share with all my friends and family. Well, I will try to make this easy so that way you don't go away (laughs) thinking, oh, I'm never doing a podcast again because of how Chris Brown treated me on that one. Um, For my listeners, to my viewers, they know what the first question out of my mouth is going to be. It's no exception to you. Charlene, where does your sense of duty to serve come from? So I love being involved in my community. I love serving my community. I love being involved in really the tough decisions and the fun decisions and the hard decisions and really connecting with others and being involved in projects that make a difference. I'm involved with my community association, my school council, girl guides, And I just really see the view as the role of public trustee as a way to serve more than just my immediate community and serve all of Calgary and to serve all the students and really make some great decisions. Now, you can give back, you can uh, serve in many ways, whether it be nonprofits, whether it be volunteerism, but in 2021, you have decided to make the leap into elected politics, school board trustee. Before I ask you the known question, I've got to ask, Was politics, was uh, getting involved uh, in elected politics uh, something that you were taught as a kid that you might want to do? Or are you, was it discussed at the family table, dinner table? Or were you the oddball out and elected politics is sort of new to your family? Um, 100% new. My family is not the politics family. We're the We're the money family. So we talk about who makes what and who makes what decisions and what the interest rates are and how to be prepared for your future and how to get your car. And that's kind of, we've always, it's always been on the edge, but it's not, never been in discussion. So um, my first real introduction to politics was just attending my community association. Our counselor comes or his assistant comes to the meeting or the MLA And I've really discovered who makes what decisions and how they're being made. And so um, when I learned more about the school board trustee and how, what their role is and how they're being done, I found that I wasn't being represented and I wasn't being consulted. And it just really made me want to get involved and make these decisions. So we'll we'll talk about some of the, uh, what you're hearing at the doorstep, what you're hearing when you're talking to your neighbors, your constituents of Ward 12 and 14. But let's talk about this election. You have decided 2021 was going to be the year that you've put your name forward and that uh, a trustee may would be the best served in 2021. Why, why now? Why, why put your name forward now? Um, So when the pandemic hit, I have two young kids. They were in kindergarten, grade one. We were homeschooling. I was, or not homeschooling. I shouldn't say homeschooling because I wasn't creating the program. I was helping my children do virtual learning. And it was a big learning curve. We had one computer, we're sharing it. And I really noticed that the kids were lacking that peer-to-peer interaction. I was really learning how connected they were to their teacher and what they were learning. And I really feel like the kids need to be in class. I really feel like we need to make decisions that are, are just benefiting them all. And I feel like this is the year that I step up. I have the time to do it. I have the passion to do it. And I think that we really need someone who really wants to promote our public education system. Now, you've literally taken the words out of my mouth for my next set of questions. Sorry. And that, that, no, which is good because I like when uh, candidates come prepared and they actually know what they want to talk about and are sort of prepared for what my questions are going to be. But I want to know, COVID-19 has changed the name of the game around schools. Um, Last year, we went to that in-person, virtual, online school system. Like you said, there were kids who were suffering because they didn't have that peer-to-peer interaction. Uh, They didn't have that teacher interaction in person. Uh, I I know my family here in Calgary, after last year, they said, "I, I don't care. I'm sending my kids back. We are in the midst of a fourth wave, though. 
The Calgary Board of Education is going to be uh, looking at how the fourth wave is going to affect school, affect the school year, and also affect the future. As the next school board trustee for Ward 12 and 14, how will you be able to help parents, help teachers, help kids move forward in an uncertain time around COVID-19? So the CBE made the decision to do mandatory masking in school, which I 100% agree with. We, I know we were excited with like the higher vaccination rates, but we have entire populations of elementary schools that are not vaccinated. We are higher than we ever were and we're not contract tracing in schools. So we're sending our children in and it's unknown. And we're getting this letter that says there was a case in, there was a case in your class. Well, now what? They're still going to school. Are we, what are we doing? And I feel like the CBE finally sent a letter to the minister of education and said, and the Minister of Health and said, like, we need more support. And that's what we need. We need the confidence to send our kids to school so they can be online learning. So we need to do at least the bare minimum of sending them in math and cohorting so that they can stay in class because no one wants to be home learning. It's really hard. And I think if we can mandate masks on public education and public buses, then we can also do it in classes. So I feel like the CBE needs to step up and make sure that we're continuing this, the um, public health measures. But then I think we also need to be letting parents know, like our cases are rising. We're thinking of doing A, B, C, and D. What are your thoughts? I think we need to communicate it more instead of it being the week before Easter break. And oh, by the way, they're home for two more weeks. How do you manage that working? I think we need more advance notice, even in these uncertain times. Well, I, I, I love that you mentioned that because engagement, communications, talking to parents is one of the key things that a school board trustee has to do. Um, you will be uh, approached by many, 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 and I say many because you are representing two wards, uh, parents who will always have the best interests of their kids at heart. But at the end of the day, you will have to make the decision based on your best knowledge on what you're hearing at the door. And sometimes that might not be what the people of Ward 12 and 14 want, because if you go ask a hundred people, you're going to get a hundred different opinions on one issue. So yeah, how, yeah. Do you, how, do you, how do you do that as a school board trustee? How do you balance the needs of everyone when everyone has a different opinion around COVID-19? While it's great that we want kids back in school, but and I use this lightly, and I know the numbers are saying that most people are in favor of masks, but there are people who don't want them. So how do you balance that? How do you communicate with people who may not agree wholeheartedly on some of the positions that you might want to agree or put forward or vote upon? So I think we just need to take the time to listen. I've received many emails and many door knocks that are really concerned about their kids wearing masks. They're concerned about anxieties. They're concerned about connections. They're concerned about a lot of things. And I think we just really need to come from a place of compassion um, and just listen to the different sides. But then at the end of the day, we need to be talking to our health minister. We need to talk to our health zone. And we really need to make decisions to keep kids healthy and keep kids safe. So um, beyond just responding to a couple of emails, I think we really need to do a better job of engagement. I think we need to do a better job of getting parent counsel um, consultations and just parent consultations and just really getting a wide variety of of the pulse of not just Ward 12 and 14, but of all the other wards. Um, I wanna take a moment and talk about what you're hearing at the door, because as a candidate, I'm assuming you had an idea of what you might, have, well, might hear at the door when you're about to go door knock. But no matter what a candidate says, they're always going to be approached by a topic that they might not have thought about. They might not have even thought that was an issue for some parents. But when you're out door knocking, when you're out talking to the people of Ward 12 and 14, are there concerns or issues around the uh, uh, school system and our Calgary Board of Education that you went, I didn't know this was an issue, but I'm happy that you're bringing it to my attention because I'm here to represent you and your voice and your opinion. So if elected, I know that on day one, you're going to want this issue addressed and I'm willing to do that. Um, so 
I was, I was going into this campaign thinking people are going to really care about the budget. They're really to care about busing. They're really to care about school capacity. The number one issue is the curriculum. Number one, it doesn't matter if they are a parent or not. It doesn't matter if they're a grandparent or not, or a teacher. It's pretty much every single door that I've knocked at. Someone has brought it up and said, what's the deal and what can you do? And it's a provincial issue at the end of the day, but the board of trustees needs to do a huge consultation, do a review and come up with point items and how they need it to be fixed and what needs to be done because parents need to be heard and it's really involving everyone. So we need to be making a stronger case to our minister of education besides the fact that we don't want to pilot it in a pandemic year. Um, there's lots of really big issues with it. So that was the number one issue and it's constant and it's, I really feel for people. I really think it needs a complete overhaul, but um, so that was the big main issue. Um, and then I've just heard lots about school days. Oh, sorry. Go so ahead. just to, just to, just to piggyback onto that, because um, every candidate I seem to talk to has said the curriculum is one of the biggest things that they're hearing at the door. While mm -hmm. you are hearing, what are you going to do about it? I've got to ask the follow-up question because you can try to knock on as many doors as you possibly can during this election. You might not get to them. So the people of Ward 12 and 14 who are listening, who might say, I'm voting for the next school board trustee because of what their opinion and how they're going to help me with this curriculum. What is your position on the provincial curriculum that was uh, introduced last year, but also as the next school board trustee for Ward 12 and 14, how will you work with the provincial government? Because at the end of the day, if the provincial government says, this is how it's going to be, this is how it's going to be. So how are you mm -hmm. going to work with parents who are against it, but also how, are you, how do you view the proposed curriculum? Um, so I don't agree with the proposed curriculum. I don't agree. I don't think it was done with adequate consultation. I think it's age inappropriate. I think it dismisses call to action items from the reconciliation recommendations. Um, I, our teachers don't support it at the end of the day. And so I've heard lots where we haven't been heard and how are we going to do this? Where are the resources coming from? So I think that the first thing the board needs to do is do a huge consultation, a huge review and create a report that clearly states we've heard this our educators hear this, and these are the action items that we think need to be changed. If they're going to be pushing it through, then we at least need to address A, B, C, and D so that we can have confidence and so that we can actually tailor programmings and learnings for teachers to be able to implement it instead of saying, here's your curriculum, enjoy the next year. Before I rudely interrupted you, and I do apologize for that, um, <laughs> you were okay. you were you were talking about school days. You were about to mention something about school days. I just want to let you finish that uh, topic before we continue on with this line of questioning as well. Not about the curriculum, but about a few other things that you're hearing at the door. So, what were you talking about school days for? So, there's been some concern about how um, the kids are being at school till the very end of June, and then starting up at the very start of September, and that there really wasn't a big enough break in between to just kind of decompress from the last year. Um, I know some people have a hard time with the half day Fridays that many elementary schools have. Uh, it's, it's just hard on parents to be able to pick up and busing and just after school care. So I've, I heard quite a bit of that and how are we going, like how can we um, change some of the instruction days um, just to make it easier on parents. So how can we fix that? Because you're, you're, you, I'm assuming you, you've had to answer this question at the door. So for those who are listening in Ward 12 and 14, how do we fix that? Because I, I didn't know that there was half day instructional days. Like that seems very new to me. I, I, I didn't go to the Calgary Board of Education school system. So I don't know, but half day Friday seems like it would be hard on parents. How do we help parents who do have this issue? It's tough, right? Because I know my school, I know I think a lot of teachers benefit from it because I think they do lots of their team building in the afternoon. They do a lot of prep for the next week. So um, I'm not sure if we could, I'm not sure. I guess that, that's the end of the day. I think it's a discussion that the board needs to have that needs to be had with the administration to see how can we, at least up front, say these are the days that we're off. 
these are the half days and this is why and just have an understanding of yes it's un- yes it may be not great but this is the reason why the decision is being made so um, it might not be able to be a change I can necessarily make but it's a conversation that needs to be addressed at least now I want to go back to the three items that you mentioned at the beginning of the topics that you had in your mind that you thought you were going to be talking about at the doors, which is budget, buses, and school sizes. Mm-hmm. Um, school sizes is probably one of the biggest issues that you, no matter who you talk to, there's always an opinion that school size, school classroom sizes need to be smaller, so that way children can have better one-on-one time with the teacher. What about school sizes, in your opinion, needs to be changed and needs to be addressed in the next four years for our students? We need smaller classroom sizes, period. The one-on-one interaction and the expectations we have on our teachers to meet their goals is very difficult if we have one teacher with, I think my son has 27 or 29 kids in his class. So that that one-on-one is very tough in a grade three classroom. And Um, You know, we expect our teachers to communicate and to do all these great things, but we need to allow them to have the time to do it. So having educational assistants in, having them, like our school has a dedicated gym and music teacher, and that helps them to experience different teachers. Um, And beyond that, I mean, our high schools are full. They're overutilized. We're sending our kids an hour, 40 minutes on the bus to school and back. And that's a lot of their day not being spent in school or in activities or after school jobs or exploring their passions. Um, I know personally, I'd be exhausted if I was traveling on a public transit for up to two hours a day. It's crazy. So um, we're at like 120% utilization down South here. We need another high school. We need the capacity. We need to be able to actually get kids in classrooms and have everyone have a seat. Um, To do that, you need to allocate money. You need to potentially mm-hmm. talk to the provincial government to build a new high school. Uh, yeah. I know up here in the Northeast, there is in the far, far Northeast of Skyview and Ranch uh, Hills or Ranch View, if I'm not mistaken, they're, they need a school as well because mm-hmm. they're doing the exact same thing. They're moving around, but it all comes down to budget, 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 budget. We, The province says they don't have enough money. They have uh-huh. potentially rolled back some money to the school board, school, the boards of education in this provincial budget this year. So on your budget topic, how do we do that? How do we allocate funding for lower classroom sizes when we don't have the money to do that? Or is there another th- way that I'm not even thinking about that you're saying, okay, we need to look outside the box and we need to do it this way? Yeah, that's the thing, right? Like we would all love to have unlimited resources and to do all these things, right? Like that's the ideal. No one wants a full classroom size. No one wants, you know, student councils paying for the smart board upgrades, right? So I think we need to just really take a really hard look at the budget and see what do we really need and what do we not need and what can we downsize on and how can we support the decisions for smaller classroom sizes? I don't think it's an easy cut this line item off, but I think it's, it's going to be a work in progress and just really working at making it equitable. And so that everyone has a fair chance at a great education system. So it's, um, it's not an easy fix. And I think if it was, we wouldn't be talking about it. It would just be done. So I'm willing to work. I'm willing to learn. I'm willing to just make all those conversations because I can't make a big promise that I'm going to do, do this because I'm one of seven. Um, and I, I just really want what's best for, for everyone overall. No, understandable. Um, I want to ask about buses because you were the first school board trustee that I've talked to that has brought up the issue around buses. And I, I want to know what you, what you had in your, in your mind when you started to run around busing and why this was going to be a potential issue you were going to hear at the door. So it was a huge issue um, in 2017. They moved a lot of the bus stops and kids were walking really far distances. Um, They did address that and kind of have more centralized locations and more accessibility. But I think it was last year, the bus fees went, because we got less funding, they increased bus fees like two times the regular rate. And people were paying a lot for busing. Um, I can pull up, I'll have to pull up the actual number, but it was, it was significantly high. And so parents were paying a lot for busing and really deciding, 
are we actually doing busing this year? Not doing busing and is busing affordable for us to get to school? Um, and then halfway through the school year, they realized, <laughs> oh, we have all this surplus because they weren't in school. And so here's like, it was a lot of money that they gave back to parents. And so I think it's just when we're looking at the budget, what do we, what is the actual cost and what are the other solutions? Are there certain schools that need certain buses? Can we, I don't know. <laughs> I just, it's, it's been a con consistent issue. And I think when you're paying to get your kid to school, it, it maybe makes public school not look all that great because, you know, you expect to just send your kid off to school. I, 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 I've always found it hard to believe that parents have to pay to bus their kids to school, but that is, that is my own unpopular opinion. I think we should get rid of them. I think busing should be free for kids, but that's here nor there. Um, <laughs> on your website, charlenemay2021.com, and for my listeners and to my viewers, the links to Charlene's social media pages and website are in the show notes, like every other uh, interview I've done. I want to talk about accountability because it is one of the key areas that you talk about on your website. And I'm going to quote the website and I want to get your reaction of what you mean by this. As a public, to begin quote, as a public school trustee, I will bring your concerns, i.e. the draft curriculum to the table. Trustees are responsible to lead, serve and represent Calgarians and the CBE. This is achieved by listening, attending all meetings and being accessible. Um, there's a lot to unpack there, but let's start with this. <laughs> Why is this a key priority for you? Our current trustee is not accessible. He missed a lot of his meetings his first term. And I don't think some of the decisions were made in the best interest. I've been on parent council for four years. I've never seen him come. I've never seen an email from him that says, hey, this is what's going on. You should get involved with X, Y, and Z. And as someone who attends my community association and has my elected representative at least send information every month to go four years and not know who he is or what he does. And when I look up or try to contact, it's very limited. It's disheartening. Um, so how do you today. how do you change that? How how does a trustee may change that? How does a trustee may become more accountable to the people of Ward 12 and 14? By attending the meetings, I'm going to come to parent council meetings. I want to know when they are, how often you meet, when you'd like to meet me, and what you what would you like to hear? I'll send information. If we make a big decision, I think your trustee should be posting it. Um, I think we've gone beyond just emails. I think people are active on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter, and we need to send, send out reports and send out consultations beyond just an, an email that might go to your spam box. Or if your parent council only has eight to 10 members, only reaching a very tiny minority of the parents of all the students. And so I think we need to find new ways to connect. Um, I, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate for a second. Mm -hmm. I like, I, I like playing here. devil's advocate here. Yeah. Communications is a double edged sword. Mm -hmm. You can communicate till you're blue in the face. You can communicate <laughs> with social media emails, go into those meetings, but there will be that one person who always says, well, I didn't get it. So mm -hmm. how do you, how do you be accountable to everyone where in today's society, we are the most connected we have ever been in the in, in our lifetime in the world's history. But there are still going to be people out there who just don't want to hear it or don't believe that you have done your job being accountable. So how do you do it? How do you balance that approach of communicating, 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 but people not getting it still? <laughs> That's the thing, right? Like you're never going to meet a hundred percent of people there. Right. Um, but my goal is to have the best interest of our students and try my best to represent parents. And so I'm going to be there. I'm going to listen. I'm going to have the tough conversations and that they may not like my answer and that's okay, but I want them to feel heard. And because we all live in different realms and we all view things differently and we just really need to have that connection um, and I think 
I think it's just trying to be there and I'm not going to appease everyone. It's, it's impossible, but my goal is to make policies that are the best for as many people as I possibly can. Now on that note, because you, you just, you, you just said something that has sparked my peak, my perked my ears. And I want to ask this question. You, you were going to have to make some tough choices. You were going to have to say no to people because you will have two wards coming to you and asking for everything under the bus because they believe their children believe, have, the, uh, have the right to have the best education. And they do, understandably. Mm -hmm. But they will say, I want my classroom sizes at 10 children. I want my classroom sizes eight. I want less instructional days. But at the end of the day, some of the issues that people bring to you aren't feasible aren't viable, aren't fiscally responsible. How do you balance that? Because I, I, I have known politicians to promise everything under the sky and it does not end well for them. So how do you say no? And how do you still talk to people in an age where if politicians say no, they're gonna just, people are gonna walk away and say, well, I, I'm never going to get anything from that person ever again. So I'm never going to approach them. How do you strike that balance? And how do you be cordial and respectful to people who may not, who may not agree with how you are doing your job, but also how you're bringing forward issues to the table? So that's why I have goals, right? I'm not, I'm not promising X, Y, and Z. I can't promise 10 kids in a classroom. I can't promise 20 kids in a classroom. I can promise that I'm going to do the best to set the budgets. Um, and trustees can't really get too involved with the day-to-day -day operations. So we can set out the budget. We can send out the weighted moving average and the RAMs to all the different schools. Um, the principals from there allocate resources internally as well. So we can set a policy that says, you know, we'd really like to make sure that this percentage gets allocated to this. And I think we can have this conversation. I think we need to balance things. I think we need to look at even what the Catholic school's doing and Edmonton Public School and how are they serving their students differently than we are. I think we just need to, I think we just need to listen. We need to find out what their goals are and why. Like, why is this important to them? And is it important to more people? And we just don't hear from it because everything else is going well. And not everyone emails, right? Like most people get involved when there's an issue, right? It's, I have A, B, C, and D. A is really important to me and B is kind of important, but B is important to everyone, but it's just not, it's not getting them out to actually voice that opinion. So I think it's just trying to be open and realizing that there's always room for growth and we're always moving towards the goal of a great public education system. Um, we're, we're literally an hour and a half hour into this interview already. I, I was going to say an Sorry. hour, but half, half hour in, into this interview. And I want to turn to your role as the next school board trustee for Ward 12 and 14. We've talked about policy. We've talked about priorities, um, but your role. Um, on October 19th, you wake up and you are elected the next school board trustee for Ward 12 and 14. What is priority number one for you? Priority number one is team building with the board. We are seven different voices elected in seven different um, areas, and we need to get together and find a way to communicate with each other, to connect with each other, to grow with each other. And that's number one. I want us to be a unified front. I want us to work through differences. I want us to constantly pushing each other for greatness. Um, step number two is I want to get the consultation process going um, with all our stakeholders, with the draft curriculum, with um, public health measures, with just governance and guidance and trying to get us on the same page and just moving forward. And then I really want to start getting into my wards. I want to meet the parent councils. I want to learn about the concerns and just really be able to be a strong advocate for my community. Sorry, now, that's more than one thing. <laughs> no, but hey, I, I like ambitious people because we need ambitious people in politics and I appreciate that. Um, I, I, I do want to jump into this though. You talked about goals. I, mm -hmm. I, I, as a small business owner myself, I know you need to put goals in place. I call them metrics, but metrics and goals in place to ensure you are successful, to ensure that you are doing what you've set out to do. So 
let's talk about 2022 in October, October, 2022. What would be a successful year for you? And what goals are you going to put in place if you were elected on October 18th to ensure that you can go back to the people of Ward 12 and 14 and say, I have accomplished X, Y, and Z, or I have started X, Y, and Z to help move the CBE forward, but also to ensure that your voices are heard at that table. What goals are you putting in place for yourself to ensure that you are successful in your first year? So my first goal is to make sure that I've reached out to every single parent council and that I've set a goal to at least meet them virtually, meet them in person, or to at least send out um, a consult with them as to what they feel needs to be done. Um, and I would really like the CBE to have a strong consultation and report about our draft curriculum. I think it's very important that we set out as a board what our thoughts are as other divisions have done. And they've clearly stated, we've heard X, Y, and Z, we're concerned about X, Y, and Z. And, and this is how, if this is or when, because it's as we're right now, it's a when it's being implemented that our teachers are supported and ready to go. So that's my, those are my two really big things in the, right away. Awesome. Um, I, I love the next question that I'm about to ask, and I usually ask it at the end, but I'm going to ask it now because you, you seem like you're ready for this question. <laughs> you know, you are one vote. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, you are one vote. You talk about team building. That's great. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants team building, but at the end of the day, you are one vote. You are there to represent the people of Ward 12 and 14 at the Calgary Board of Education. But at the end of the day, you are also there to represent the Calgary Board of Education. You are there to represent all people of Calgary who send their kids to uh, public education, uh, public, the Calgary Board of Education. Sometimes that means Ward 12 and 14 might not get their fair share of the pie. Sometimes that means you will have to go back to your constituents and say, I, I, I advocated it, I, I asked, but this area was more in need of this funding and we will be looking at our area next time. Mm -hmm. we, we talk about that accountability. As the next school board trustee for Ward 12 and 14, accountability is going to be a big thing. How do you talk to your constituents and say, I'm trying to get the best for our city, for our wards, I mean, but at the end of the day, we have to look at a bigger picture. That's the thing, right? Like we're a huge board. We're the biggest board in Alberta. We are very diverse and equity and funding sometimes hurts, <laughs> right? We, we all want better, but sometimes other schools need more. Sometimes other communities need more. Like South, like North Calgary, like you said with high school, needed a new high school. Does South Calgary High School need a high school? Absolutely. But did North at the current time really need it? Absolutely. So I think um, it's still continuing to share our issues, continuing to share our goals. But you know, I'm well, I'm ready to work at the whole picture because it's, I would love to do everything for Warden 12 and 14, but at the end, we also have to understand just because you live in Ward 12 and 14 doesn't mean you're going to go to school in Ward 12 and 14, right? Your school, your child may be going to a school in, an, in a different ward. And so yeah. I need to work with bordering wards to make sure that all of CBE is, rep is represented. So it's, it's not just, I'm not in this little bordered bubble. We bust kids out, kids get bussed in, um, especially if you're doing like dual language or um, the advanced programs, like you're going to be going to a different school. And so I can't just, can't just be this nice little border of I'm only representing these opinions. We need to work together and, and just really collaborate. Awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. Thank you for answering that question. Um, now, in order to get to October 19th, in order to get to October 2022, you have to be elected on October 20th or October 8th, October 18th. Sorry, I've written it down. <laughs> There's too many I, numbers I know right now. <laughs> too many elections, too many elections in the last few days. Um, I want to ask the question. 
talk to the people of Ward 12 and 14. Why should you be their representative in the next for the next four years at the Calgary Board of Education for the wards of 12 and 14? Go ahead whenever you're ready. So I believe in public education. I believe in public schools. I believe in our teachers and students administration. And I believe that we have to be constantly moving forward and doing what's best for our children. We need to make the tough decisions. We need to ask for more funding. We need to just really band together and just make a really good public education system. I feel like I'm the best for that job. I'm ready to work, I'm ready to listen, and I'm just really ready to just get involved and make these amazing um, goals happen and just really promote the CBE and have this sense of, I'm so excited that my kids public school did X, Y, and Z and just be really proud of it. Now, I guarantee you, because I've, I've gotten comments like this, that there is one person listening to their car radio, listening to this podcast on the Deerfoot right now, yelling at their radio saying, why didn't you ask this question? There's probably someone on YouTube saying the exact same thing. Why didn't you ask this question? While I can try to ask as many questions as I possibly can in the time that we are given to with each other, how can people reach out? How can people learn more? How can people ask you a direct question about their concerns because like i said at the beginning you could probably try and your hardest to knock on as many, all the doors as possible but it you're one person and you're only one person so how can people get involved how can people reach out and ask you the question that's on their mind for ward 12 and 14. so my website is charlene may 2021.com um i'm also on facebook i'm on instagram i'm on twitter um email me and i'm the one who answers it um, I, I'm not, well, I'm, I say I'm on Twitter. I'm not huge on many of these platforms. I'm dipping my toe in. I'm not, um, I find that there's lots of news on there and I've tried to kind of increase my availability. Um, so if you send me an email or send me a Facebook message, I'm the one What's who's your answering. Email? Uh, it's, um, Charlene May. <laughs> what? Charlene made 2021 at gmail.com. I don't know why I drew a blank there. Um, for you my listeners, and, there. For, that's, that's the hardest question I've had to ask all day. <laughs> for my listeners and to my viewers, I've got to say uh, Charlene's link links to Charlene's website, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, and email address are in the show notes so for those who are listening audio version it's in the show notes so go back to the main page and click on the show notes and then for my youtube literally scroll down after the interview it's right there it, you can't miss it um charlene uh, I, I i say this to a lot of people and i mean it sincerely and i'm gonna say it to you because we need more people like you in politics. We need more people like you who are sincere, honest, and are doing it for the right reasons. We have a lot of people in this election who are not doing it for the right reasons, and I find that you are. Um, I, I would highly recommend the people of Ward 12 and 14 to educate yourself in this election. Find the person that represents your values and your morals and vote for them. Advanced voting is from the 4th to the 10th, and then on election day on October 18th. Charlene, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been um, so good. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, and I'm going to say this one last time because I'm beating a dead horse at the end of the day. If you do not vote, you do not get to complain. Go in <laughs> and vote. Vote, 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 vote. It's not that hard. Literally take an hour out of your day, hour and a half, depending on lineups because of COVID-19, and get out and vote. I do not want to see you complaining on social media for the next four years that your voice isn't heard if you do not vote. So go out and vote. Uh, we will be back tomorrow with another episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Charlene, thank you so much. Thank you.